Hey, this is Justin Moore from Trending Family, and here are the top five trending articles in advertising this week. So super interesting article in Fast Company about the EVP of brand partnerships at Atlantic Records. Her name is Camille Hackney, uh, and she has a really interesting approach for how she marries some of Atlantic's uh, artists like Cardi B and Christina Perry with brands. So for example, Christina Perry uh, has a tattoo of a Mini Cooper on her foot. And she took that info, went to BMW, and forged this relationship. And they ended up sponsoring several of uh, Christina Perry's music videos. So I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of this speculative uh, brand outreach, uh, especially from from larger influencers. You know, most kind of mid tier, even larger influencers are used to having everything be inbound, right? They don't do any anything speculative. But I think you're going to start seeing this more and more and more. It makes sense, right? Like if an influencer authentically loves your brand, then it makes sense to kind of formalize the relationship. And, and see how you can create kind of a more protracted partnership. Great article in Digiday about how a lot of publishers and influencers are using Instagram stories and the swipe up feature to try to control a little bit more of their audience, whether that's for e-commerce or for you know email list, newsletter, that kind of thing. Uh, just anecdotally, we've seen a lot of a big drop in engagement on Snapchat, we've seen a lot of people move over to Instagram stories. I think a lot of people, especially publishers, are kind of gun shy with the huge drop in organic engagement on Facebook and th their audiences. I think a lot of people, I mean, of course, Instagram Instagram's owned by Facebook, so um, you know I think there's a little bit of concern there in terms of how much you're driving off platform. There's conspiracy theories about that, right? If you're if you're linking people outside of the Facebook platform, then you know you're going to start seeing a, a drop in your engagement because you're making people leave Facebook's walled garden, right? And so I think there's that mindset on Instagram too that people are a little bit they want to be strategic about how much they're kicking people off there, or, you know, sending people away from Instagram to their own properties, uh, and that they may be penalized in the future for that. Great interview that Axios did with the CEO of LinkedIn and it was all about what the internet's biggest mistakes can teach us about the future. So super interesting topic. Um, and essentially what he was saying was that uh, in the beginning, a lot of publishers and uh, companies uh, had a goal of creating high quality content, right? But then they built a business model around that that was driven by clicks and traffic. And when you do that, of course, the quality of the content is going to devolve. Um, and so uh, the, I think the implication for, for brands and publishers is that they need to take a, a good hard look at the content that they're creating and figure out if the right set of incentives are in place to to get that quality content that they're looking for. I think that YouTube has this problem, right? Like, you know, especially back in the day, it was driven by clicks and traffic and you saw a lot of this like clickbait, right? And a lot of people just putting up thumbnails that were crazy to drive clicks. And so they've gotten better at that. But um, you've also seen some of this content, some of the influencers, some of the really large influencers that you see putting out some kind of controversial and, and questionable content sometimes um, because of this kind of perverse incentive scheme that I think has happened. So I think we're going to kind of see a shift over the next, you know, one to two years. Uh, and, and YouTube really, I think, has a tall order to, to figure this piece out. So YouTube is updating the YouTube Kids app with more parental controls. And this includes things like curation and collections of channels from what they call trusted partners like PBS, um, and then other like the YouTube Kids team uh, channels that they've chosen. And then also parents can now whitelist specific channels, which, so if a parent, as a parent, I say, oh, I really like this channel. I think it's good for my kid. Uh, you can actually put that in the app that, you know, they can watch this um, and some some other features. So I think this is really interesting. It's, a, it's an acknowledgement by YouTube that they understand that kids who are less than 13, which is how old you have to be to have the the, the normal YouTube app, are, are watching YouTube. And even before they had the YouTube Kids app, you know, my son who's four, you know, he was, if he wanted to watch a YouTube video, he was watching on my account, right? I didn't have a separate account for him. Um, so I think it's, it's important that they're acknowledging this, they're putting in place features uh, just to give, uh, you know, more parents control. And there's a new social network for Gen Z, which is called Maverick. They just raised a couple million dollars. It was created by some ex-Disney executives. Um, they've got uh, Brooklyn and Bailey McKnight uh, as launch partners. There's going to be some live event, uh, you know, features and components of this network. Um, it'd be, be pretty interesting. Um, I don't think that there's the only kind of comparable network that I can think of uh, would be like Musical.ly or House Party. Uh, some of these apps that are catering more towards a younger demographic. Um, but it'll be 
really interesting to see what they're trying to do with this. I think there is an acknowledgement that Gen Z is getting older, they have more purchasing power, uh, and you're gonna start seeing a lot of this conversation shift from like millennial to Gen Z. Um, so it's interesting that they're kind of creating a, a specific social network trying to cater to this demographic, we'll see.